tutorial. Um, I know there are a lot of other interesting tutorials also going on in fact also. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, so today's tutorial uh, is going to be presented by three of us. Uh, so we have Vijay, Amit, that's myself, and Dennis. And uh, yes, this is Vijay and this is Dennis. And uh, what we'll do is essentially we'll uh, cover certain parts uh, amongst us uh, where we'll spread through uh, three of us. Uh, although just three of us are presenting, uh, this work was uh, obviously a big effort uh, because as you'll see, uh, it's not just the GitHub repo that we have uh, open source, but there's a, there, there has been a lot of effort in terms of designing the web pages, creating tutorials, and a lot of other sort of demos and other UX kind of stuff. So it was a big team that actually made it possible to uh, essentially get some this. So uh, yeah, you'd like to kind of so this is the rough uh, sort of roadmap, and uh, as you can see, it's, it's quite packed. So what? Just to start off with, what I'll do is before we get to the toolkit, uh, I'll, I'll give a very uh, quick overview of explainable AI and sort of the basic methods and so on and so forth. I won't spend too much time on it, but uh, I'll just sort of level set uh, what essentially, what kind of methods and what kind of frameworks we're talking about. Um, and then I'll, then I'll uh, also talk about a taxonomy that we have created based on the explainability space and the type of methods that are there. And uh, we hope that this will provide uh, people a way to essentially traverse this complex space in terms of uh, choosing the right algorithms for the problems that they have in hand. And uh, with that, I'll hand over to Vijay who will give you a demo as well as talk about installing AIX360 and uh, essentially Intera is more than that. And then we'll end the session with Dennis uh, taking you to a tutorial, a finance tutorial, where he'll take you through three different algorithms that are part of it. And uh, in the second session, we'll again have two tutorials. And uh, we'll then talk about essentially uh, future directions and explainability, but more focused on the toolkit and uh, things that we hope to accomplish with your uh, So without further ado, uh, let me start with the uh, first, first part. So uh, as we know, um, AI is, is being used for many high stakes decisions, such as in credit, employment, uh, admissions, sentencing, and so on and so forth. Um, so just having a system which is highly accurate on some sort of end outside is no longer sufficient uh, for successful deployment. So what you, so the questions that arise are, is it fair, is it easy to understand, uh, is it robust, or, and is it accountable? So these kind of four uh, pillars, as we call, uh, form, help you to sort of trust the system. And the focus, obviously, of this tutorial will be on the second pillar. Uh, so, uh, as we know, uh, Explainable AI, uh, there has been a lot of press and a lot of attention given to Explainable AI in the recent, the recent years. Uh, and uh, the main reason for this to happen is because of the proliferation of uh, black box models like DeepNets. Uh, and as you can see, I mean, DeepNets are not sort of directly interpretable. Uh, and so you need other mechanisms to try to understand how the decision was the right uh, There's also, uh, being in Europe, uh, I probably, probably you guys know more than me, uh, the, the GDPR which was passed which says that uh, any sort of automated decision making system that makes decisions for humans should also provide meaningful information uh, in terms of how the decision was arrived at. So trust is one of the sort of key things for uh, motivating explainability. Uh, but there are certain other also interesting reasons why explanations or explainability might be useful. Uh, so there was this uh, interesting case I think a few years back where uh, uh, a team of researchers had built this uh, very complicated neural network. And the uh, neural network was essentially trained to uh, separate 
uh, regular code from malware. And it had a very high accuracy, so people assumed that, okay, it was probably sort of extracting some sort of subtle signals uh, that helped it classify so accurately. But then there was this other team of researchers who thought, okay, let's see, I mean, what is this thing trying to do? And so they sort of delved into the network and they did these tests to see what kinds of uh, code it was able to successfully classify, as well as they uh, were using certain explanatory methods to sort of delve in to figure out uh, what was really happening. And it turned out that most of the performance was basically could be attributed to one simple thing. The, the, the model was basically checking if the code was commented or not. Because presumably if you have malware you wouldn't be commenting it very well. So it was just checking if there were comments or not. So, so this is an example, I think there are multiple lessons here. One is obviously you don't want such a model to be deployed because it's easy to break. But uh, more generally, even if you want it to be deployed, the point is that you can, if you once you have this insight, you can now essentially deploy the same uh, kind of decision-making system, but in a much more simpler way. So you can just have a single. Way. So explanatory can also help in sort of simplifying very complicated models. So that's one other motivation besides just trust. Um, now there is this other case where uh, this was also a few years back where uh, uh, there is this network. Uh, deep net uh, trained on uh, Tesla cars uh, where they were trained to essentially decide when the car should stop. Uh, so they used this model and they put it in a different car. And what they found was that when the car saw a red signal, it would slow down, but it didn't stop. It just kept on going. Uh, so they were wondering why is this happening? I mean, uh, the original car is stopping. So as they looked into it, they figured out that uh, in the Tesla braking system, there's something that when, when it saw a red signal, it would slow down, and there's something called as a lurch, which would kick in. And the model had learned that only once it uh, detects this lurch, it should actually stop the car. But once they put it into a different car, this lurch never kicked in, so the car just slowed down, but it never stopped. Uh, so, uh, so, methods. To understand the systems can also help you debug uh, systems in this way. Where you can essentially try to understand things why why things don't transfer and so on. Um, this is uh, another example. Uh, this is more related to causality. So uh, this was tried with healthcare data, where uh, they found that there was a very high accuracy model, which was basically saying that if you have pneumonia you won't have diabetes. Uh, I'm not a healthcare expert, but seemingly these two things are unrelated. But the reason this was happening was that a lot of people who had pneumonia, you get checked not just for specific disease, but they do a bunch of other tests. So diabetes was one of the things that you also got tested for. And so most of these people didn't have diabetes. So if you created a data set where you had these indicators saying, oh, was this person, did this person have pneumonia? And if this person had diabetes, there was a strong sort of um, negative correlation between the two. So if you build a model that is picking up on these kind of artifacts to make predictions, although there is no sort of causal relationship between the two. And then besides that, this is uh, actually an interesting reason also to have more uh, interpretable or explainable models. Is that in many domains, the final decision is eventually taken by a human. So if a human understands why the decision was made, the system of the machine and the human together, which actually makes the decision, can be much more efficient and much more accurate than just having a black box model which makes the prediction. Uh, so eventually, at least the current state of society where humans are taking the final decisions in many of these domains, even having a suboptimal in terms of accuracy, a model which is suboptimal, but something that one actually is able to understand and uh, somewhat reason with, can help in increasing the overall performance in terms of the final decision making. So, uh, so, so these were some of the main sort of uh, 
motivations for explanation. Uh, then there are obviously other things like fair, is the system fair, as well as robustness and generalizability in the sense that there is this very uh, popular example where uh, they trained the student network to detect wolves as opposed to dogs. And they found out that uh, essentially most wolf pictures occur in snow. So if you put a wolf with say a green grass or a lawn, it would still detect it as, as a dog because it was basically just a snow detector. So, so things like that. Uh, but all these are required for uh, widespread adoption of the act because you need something that's robust. Um, so this is an uh, interesting article uh, which Jeff Hinton had put where he said oh, we don't need explainability. So this is, a, this is an interesting discussion. Do you really need explainability for trust or not? So, uh, but in the interest of time, I won't uh, sort of belabor this point. Uh, if, if you want, you can discuss this so that we be offline. So when, once you come to explanations, so there's not a single explanation that fits every situation. Uh, and there are different ways in which you can slice and dice different explanability techniques. Uh, so, you, so you have uh, something that's uh, a list of models where for proliferation of deep nets, I mean even now they are used in many domains, uh, like directly interpretable models. Where say for example like decision trees, where it's very clear what the what, how the prediction was reached at. I mean, you can just follow the tree. Uh, there are also other directly interpretable methods uh, like rule lists, decision lists, and so on and so forth. Uh, in fact, one of the speakers is an expert in that uh, that we have here. So the, these are not directly interpretable in the sense that you know how the decision was made. Then, when you, when you come to deep nets, you have essentially uh, methods which are more post hoc. So even before deep nets, uh, if you work in industry, you would know that uh, in many cases, if there was some system which was making automated decisions, it would usually be a mixture of models. So you might have some business rules, and you might have something that's trained on a certain amount of data and so on and so forth. And the combination of these things would help you reach the final decision. So, so such models are also uh, not directly interpretable because combination of different things and you don't know how each of these things are essentially weighing in the findings. So you need methods that can essentially somehow delve into these models and try to give at least a feel for what's happening. So one of the arguably the most popular method uh, for doing local post hoc explanations is LINE, which stands for locally interpretable uh, uh, model agnostic and uh, the, the idea is very simple here in line is that say you're trying to explain a decision for a particular instance like the uh, bolded plus sign there and you have a very complicated decision boundary. So the way line works is that what it does is it will take that point and then it will put up that point. So it will create a bunch of points around that point and then it just fits uh, a sparse linear model. So like lasso, re lasso repression to the sort of soft predictions of your original complex model. So if your com original complex model is predicting say probability of 0.9, 0.8 or whatever, 0.7% classes you essentially fit that way. And then whatever features your sparse linear model highlights, it would say are the reasons why this point was classified in that fashion. So that's my um, you can also have uh, explanations of not just models but also of data. And so there are methods that essentially select prototypes as well as non prototypical examples which are called criticisms, which are essentially like borderline examples. So the prototypes are uh, examples which are sort of characteristic of your data set. And since your data set is large, it's not possible to look at all the instances in your data set. So you want a few, set of few that kind of characterize your data set and this, these methods essentially give you that. So for example, if you look at the top row here, uh, those are some dog breeds and those are sort of standard pictures of those dogs, but then if you add a scar or you have some rabbit ear or so on and so forth, these are more sort of outlying examples that you would see. So, so there are methods which can help you also explain your data. So that's the point. Then in the image space, 
Um, you have post hoc methods, so saliency maps is one of the very standard methods. And so what you're trying to do here is you're trying to explain the top row images and the explorations are at the bottom and all these explanations basically are saying is that say the leftmost image was classified as something having a boat so it would essentially highlight you can see the white highlighting is around where the boat essentially is so it will highlight objects that are there in your image as to why that image is classified in the fashion images so uh, and the method here is very simple they just see how much your output changes with respect to your Input. So if you vary the input a bit, how much does the output vary? Um, there are also, so, so, so the method before was more local, that is you give a specific example and then you explain that example, but there are also more global methods and one very pop, pop, popular method there is called knowledge distillation, where say if you have your neural network which is giving predictions and now you want to understand just globally roughly what's happening. You can take the predictions of your model and then fit a directly interpretable model, like a decision tree or a rule list or so on. And then uh, try, to get, try to gauge what's generally globally sort of happening. And then there are also other methods where you can visualize intermediate layers of your neural network and so on and so forth. Like, uh, so if you're predicting cats, you can see that if there are features that are being picked by these intermediate layers which kind of resemble things that might correspond to a fan. So maybe ears or face um, or the, sort of the relative positioning of eyes. So like, like we just saw there are like many types of explanations and even more number of explanatory methods. And the reason you need these different explanatory methods is because uh, there's no single, there's, there's no sort of definition of what is a good explanation. So, in different situations, you might need either one or more of these methods in combination uh, to uh, possibly satisfy final users. Or maybe not even satisfy, you might need even more of them. Um, so, based on this, since the space is so vast, and there's so many types of methods, uh, what we did, uh, which is part also of the toolkit, uh, on the main website, we, we, we created a taxonomy. Uh, so we, 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 our aim was not to go towards sort of perfection, but make something that's simple enough and useful for most people to sort of navigate this um, So before we get to that, uh, let me talk about AI 360 a little bit. Um, so the current uh, version, so the initial version which was released uh, around five months back in August, had eight explanatory algorithms um, all from IBM. But right now we have a version uh, two release which has ten and uh, this has essentially nine which happened in it. Um, so there are two metrics that the toolkit also has and uh, there are a bunch of notebooks and demos and so on and so forth as well as a lot of guidance for people uh, for to help practice. <coughs> And this toolkit is sort of not in silo. Uh, the year before last, so in 2018, there were two other toolkits released, one for fairness and one for uh, essentially adverse early robots. And there is a plan to release something also for that. So this is essentially a taxonomy that we have created uh, for, a, for essentially navigating the space. And as you can see, the taxonomy is also a small decision tree. So itself is kind of interpretable in that sense. Uh, so let me start at the top. Um, so you can have, so as you can see, uh, you can have either static explanations or it can be interactive where you sort of go back and forth. And as you can see, most of the methods and models that have been developed are more of a static nature. Uh, so in the static, you can have data explanations or model explanations. So in the data branch, um, we have two methods right now. Uh, Protodash and DPA. So Protodash is more case-based reasoning like the example that I showed you where it will sort of pick prototypes as well as sort of outlying examples to explain your data. But we also have the other one, DPA, which is more of uh, where your features that are given to you themselves are not interpretable. So for like, for, for example, like images. Like pixels are not really interpretable to you, right? Because if I tell you I have, you increase the intensity of this pixel, something happens. 
it's very hard for you to sort of understand what's really happening. So the thing is, when your features are not interpretable for uh, uh, in your domain, uh, the dip lane method essentially creates higher level features from images which uh, could be interpretable. So, they, so even if you give it a bunch of images, it will create features like, oh, this corresponds, they say it's a closed data set. So something might correspond to the C length, or if it's a shoe data set, it might correspond to E length and so on. And then uh, most of the effort is in the model space, and you can have local or global uh, explanations. In local uh, is basically for instance several explanations. You can have post hoc out and self explaining. So post hoc is something that I just spoke about, which is basically giving an explanation for every point for a black black box model. And here too you can have either case based or feature based. And line and shaft, for example, form the following feature based. But we also have uh, methods which are like contrast and so on and so forth. And then uh, that is a method in the, in the category by itself where besides the inputs and outputs, if you are also given a set of explanations, you uh, specified by the domain expert, you can actually recover not just the labels but also the list. Uh, and the model, is, the model uh, that is used to arrive these explanations may not be covered. That's why it's under self um, In the global, you have directly interpretable models, like I spoke about. So currently, uh, we have uh, a model which basically generates rules uh, in a directly interpretable category. For post hoc, we have something called profit, which is uh, uses some kind of weighting to improve our already directly interpretable model. Uh, so this is generally how we have mapped the space, and these are essentially the 10 algorithms that are currently available to us. So this is just a sh short summary of how AI actually relates to other toolkits that are out there. So we believe that arguably we are the most comprehensive in terms of covering all the different categories. Um, and uh, like I said, the law, it's not just a data but there is a lot of educational money when it comes to um, So with that, uh, I think, uh, so I will hand it to Vijay, who will take you through the interactive web experience which is part of the toolkit and also talk about installing package installation before we get to the tutorial. Thank you. Also, if, if you guys have any questions, please interrupt and ask. Uh, you don't have to wait So you mean for uh, you mean in the taxonomy figure? So uh, so the question was sorry. Uh, yeah. So 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 right now, yeah. So in the tutorials, we'll go over some of these methods, and we'll also at the end we'll talk about which more methods we would like to have. And hopefully, you guys get a sense into it. Yeah. So you'll, you'll see some of them in detail in the use cases that we'll go through. So um, this is a demo related to uh, the 
finance and uh, it essentially studies the example of an AI model who tries to determine if a customer should be given the loan or not. And uh, as Amit was mentioning earlier, uh, some of the AI models have this black box problem and they can't explain you know, what's the logic they use to arrive at a decision. So uh, we go over three different types of explanations uh, which can be generated using the AI explicitly building. Okay. And um, you'll see how those explanations are actually useful to different explainees or different consumers of, of the explanation. Now, before I kind of go into the explanations, uh, let's just take a look at, you know, what is the data set that is available to train this, uh, this AI model. Okay. So, um, so this data set was actually released by a company called as, as FICO in the US, who is involved in credit scoring. And although I kind of you know, loosely use the term you know, loan for a customer, it had a technical term. Uh, in this particular use case, it's called as HELOC, which stands for home to the line of credit. So what happens in the US is that, let's say uh, there's a gap between the current market value of your house and let's say the current value of your mortgage. Let's say you know your house is valued in the market today at $100,000 and the mortgage is valued at, let's say, 80000 So based on this gap, a lending institution like a bank can issue a loan to you between zero and $20,000. Uh, so of course, the bank wouldn't want to issue you a loan if you're not credit worthy, right? And one way to figure out if you're credit worthy is to take a look at your credit history. So let's say, for example, in the past you had very good relationships with several banks or several lending institutions and you had made the payments on time. Then you're probably a very good customer, credit worthy, and there's hardly any risk for the bank to issue a loan. And on the other hand, let's say for example you've already got too many loan accounts. Okay, you've defaulted in the past, you've been delinquent in the sense that you've made late repayments and so on, then probably there's a good amount of risk giving you a loan. So the bank would be hesitant to give you a loan. So what this data set does is that it has released an anonymized list of about 10,000 or so customers who had applied for loan in the past. Okay. It's a labeled data set. So for each, for each row, uh, it tells you whether the customer was essentially, you know, the loan was accepted or denied. And it has about 24 or so features which essentially summarize the credit history of a customer. And uh, my colleague Jen is actually going over the same demo in more detail than Python notebook, so you probably are going to get a better glimpse of what are the different features which exist in the data. But as I walk you through the demo, you'll kind of get a glimpse of some of the features which exist in the, uh, in the data set. So if you take a look at the life cycle of this, um, of this AI model that you know, you're trying to train, which it reminds a customer should be given a loan or not, you could imagine that it interacts with three different personas, right? The first persona is the data scientist itself, okay? So the data scientist is probably more in training the model, you know, and so on. So the data scientist requires some kind of explanation during that process. And then uh, once the model is deployed in a bank, a loan officer would interact with the uh, with the model, right? And if you use the model to you know then give the decision to a you know a loan applicant. So he would need a certain type of explanation. And lastly, a banking customer who has applied for loan, they would kind of receive the decision of the AI model, and they would want a certain type of explanation. Okay. Now let's go one by one through each of these personas use case and see what kind of explanations can be obtained using AI okay. So I'm clicking here. So by the way, this is actually an online demo. Okay, that's, you can actually log into the website and pay yourself when you get some time. Uh, so, uh, so here we are considering the case of a, a data scientist who's trying to train the model. Now, if you think about it, what is the most important thing that the data scientist would want to do? The first thing is, you would want to ensure that the logic that the model has learned is correct. 
Like you sort of know now in this presentation, you mentioned that sometimes your know, data can have these spurious correlations, right? So the data scientist needs to make sure that the correlations that the AI model has fit are the correlations that he has intended. So he needs to get a glimpse of what are the rules that the model is actually using to classify customers and you know, you know whether the loan is accepted or denied and so on. Right? That is like the first and the primary job the data scientist wants to ensure that you know the logical and model is right. Now the other thing is that the data scientist might take this logic, okay, he has some view of this logic. Now he might want to show it to uh, maybe his manager, you know, uh, you know, he approves the model, or he might want to discuss it with a you know a banking expert or domain expert, right? So he wants to make sure that does this logic make sense? You know, is this right for this domain, the banking domain or not? And the third thing is that the data scientist can also want to show the logic to a model auditor. So you probably are more aware of it being in Europe that in regulated industries like finance, what happens is that uh, typically an auditor you know checks the model, he checks the logic of the model to make sure that you know um, features like gender and race are not used for classifying you know, if a person should be given a loan or not, because that can be unfair. Right? So for all these reasons, the data scientist wants to get kind of like a global understanding of the model. It just doesn't want to, you know, it's like uh, behavioral model, one or two loan applicants, but you know, the overall behavior of the model. So one of the explainers called is GR, GLR explainer, which by the way Dennis designed. So that is an uh, explainer which is included in the library, which provides this, uh, you know, the global behavior of the model. Now, what the GLR explainer does is that it obtains a weighted combination of rules which determine the score of whether the customer is going to be accepted, or you know, whether the customer is the loan is accepted or, or denied. And because when you have a you know weighted combination of rules, the same variable can appear in multiple rules. So to make the job of the data even easier, what the explainer does is it kind of gives you uh, it kind of gives you these plots which summarize the rules for each variable in the data. So, uh, so this particular thing essentially trains a globally interpretable model. Okay. Um, so for example, if they look at the uh, variable external risk estimate, so this is one variable in the data set which summarizes what is the average credit score of the customer based on all the credit bureaus in the US. So if you think about it, this is probably already a good indicator of you know, whether the customer is credit worthy or not. Right? And the model has discovered that so the model kind of, you know, um, presents you rules of the following form that you know, if the external risk estimate is greater than 72, right, then, uh, you know, the, the score increases by a certain value. And if the, you know, estimate is greater than 75, then it again increases by a certain value. So the probability that this estimate is going to be, is going to, uh, the loan is going to be accepted or not. So using these rules, the data scientist gets an idea of what is the logic that the model is using to classify customers into whether accepted or denied. Right? Now another example here is the net revolving fraction burden. So this is another parameter for the data set, which is the fraction of what is the customer's outstanding debt on his credit card versus his credit limit. So let's say for example you have a credit limit of 5,000, but the outstanding debt is at 4,000. So it's 4 by 5, it's like 80%. That is like the net revolving fraction burden. Now, so you see in this particular uh, variable, the model, the uh, explainer says that if it's greater than 39 percent, then you will reduce the score by a certain value. Okay. So that is the kind of rule that the model is learning. And the bars that you see here, you know, the green bar and the red bar here. So these bars tell you how significant this variable is in, in making the prediction, how important it is uh, for the prediction. Here, red means it's negatively correlated and green means it's positively correlated. So, by using such rules, uh, the data scientist kind of you know gets the logic of what the model is doing, and then let's say we go to the next step in the sense that the data scientist is satisfied that the model has learned the right logic, okay, and then he deploys the model in maybe in a bank or so. On. So, let's go to the next step of what happens you know, next when the model is deployed in a bank. 
Now, once the model is deployed in the bank, uh, a loan officer or like any other banking officer probably uses the model as an assistant, right, to assess if a customer's loan should be accepted or denied. Now, how would the loan officer feel comfortable in instance? How would he um, obtain, you know, how would he sort of start trusting the model? Now, when you sort of take a look at the loan officer's perspective, the first thing he wants to know is, you know, why was the loan of a customer accepted or denied? So let's take a look at, you know, the loan of Alice. Now, Alice's loan was actually accepted by the model, okay? And uh, since it's accepted, the loan officer is wondering, you know, why was Alice's loan accepted? Now, one of the explainers in the in the library, which is called as Protodash, which uh, Amit here, uh, Amit here has designed, so what it does is it uses case-based reasoning to justify this, uh, this outcome of the model. So case based reasoning is actually used quite often in, in medicine. So let's say for example, you know, um, you give a lot of cough and cold and you go to the doctor and uh, the doctor says maybe you have pneumonia because I had these two customers, two sort of patients who came in last month and their symptoms look very similar <coughs> to yours. And when we did all the tests on those two patients, they had pneumonia. Right? So what the Protodash algorithm does is it receives cases from the training data set which is very similar to the current customer Alice whose loan is accepted and presents it to the loan officer. So the loan officer can check, for example, there are these other customers, Mia, Kate and Kala, and their applications were very similar to Alice's application and they actually repaid their loan. So it's probably it's possible that when Alice is going to repay her loan, right? And the algorithm also shows the kind of features on which, you know, the, uh, the prototypes are similar with the, to the source applicants, uh, you know, source applicants features. For example, you know, this is another parameter that we have set called as number of trades, 60 uh, you know, delinquent, which means that this is the number of uh, repayments made to the customer which are sort of beyond the days part of the due date. So the algorithm shows that, you know, Mia, Kate and Kala had very similar features similar to Alice and therefore, you know, probably Alice might repay her loan as well, so it's okay to maybe, you know, give loan to Alice. So you could use case-based reasoning like this to sort of, you know, explain to the loan officer why Alice's loan was actually approved. Yeah. What's the So it's MMD predictor here. Yeah. Maximum meters. Is there any other question uh, so far? Okay. So let's go to the next step. And uh, so let's say, for example, the loan officer you know uses the model and then you know passes the decision to the customers, right? The banking customer. Now, what is the first thing that a customer would want to know? You know, if, if the loan is accepted, I guess I guess nobody would really care to you know ask them like why the loan is accepted and so on, right? Uh, so I guess the main thing that someone would be interested in, you know, if my loan is rejected, let's say for example you are sending your resume to a, a company, your dream job, and you're you never get a call for interview, the first thing you wonder is okay, what was wrong in my in my resume, right? In the same manner, uh, let's say for example, you know, a customer's loan is you know it's denied. So the customer wonders, you know, what was wrong in the uh, in the in the loan application, right? What were the parameters which are not in the right range because of which the loan was denied? And more importantly, the customer would like to know how they can improve their loan application, right? How they can change their loan application so that in the future the loan application can be improved, right? Now these two answers actually provided by another um, another algorithm in the toolkit called as contrastive explanation method, which also was designed by um, uh, here. So what uh, the contrastive explanation method does is, firstly it gives you the feature importance of those features which are responsible for the rejection. So here, for example, in this, um, in the case of Julia's uh, application, um, there were the consolidated risk markers, this is the external risk estimate that I talked about earlier, this is the aggregate score of all the credit bureaus in the US. So it says that the 77, you know, which was kind of low, 
and there was this other parameter, number of satisfactory accounts, is the number of accounts in which Alan, in which uh, Julia had kind of you know, made the payments on time and so on. And so these are the three parameters, the top three parameters that we uh, that the algorithm said which were not right. Now the algorithm also computes what is called as a pertinent negative, which is the minimum perturbation on the set of features which would get the loan to be accepted. So it also tells uh, it also tells Julia that you know if the external risk estimate was 82 and the number of satisfactory accounts were 13 and this parameter went, you know, you know, probably 7, then your loan can be accepted. So this contrast to explanation is provided by the library. So this is very unique to the x 360 in the sense that if you're going for a line or sharp, then you essentially get these, these answers, which are feature importance is for this particular loan application. And what is the actual underlying model that you are explaining here? Uh, here we are, uh, in, this will be explained by Dennis later on. So in this example, we actually trained a neural network. So that is the black box model. And that is what is being explained here. Now in the previous use case, I showed you a globally interpretable model, the first uh, case. Now even if you had deployed, let's say, globally interpretable model, right, because of proprietary reasons, by the time you pass off the model to the bank, it ends up being the bank, of course, right? So, uh, uh, because, uh, for example, a uh, lot of uh, you know law enforcement agencies in the U.S. have, for example, we have heard about Compass and lots of other. Um, so, a lot of these may be using very simple rules, but the black box is because the company doesn't want to really disclose the logic dimension. You get to get more about it in the Python tutorial in the next uh, lecture. Uh, so, do you, like, do you show here the categorical features as well? Like, do you show that if you were male, you were accepted? Okay, maybe I'll let you know. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so in the toolkit, uh, the thing we have deployed is mostly, I mean, it considers everything numeric. Uh, that is real value. Um, the thing is that we have something that does categorical and also model agnostic, but that's part of IBM product, so we couldn't show open source. Okay. That. But we have a paper out. But, but that's one of the most important things, that yeah. Because like, if you talk about races or genders, all of them are categorical. Of course, yeah. there are latent uh, features as well. Right. But the main thing that defines the fairness is yeah. categorical. Right. I mean, if you have, <laughs> since like, well, like for male female, it's probably binary. Uh, so you can probably use this and then round it. Um, yeah. Because it can change it to something more like well. Yeah. So you can approximate it that way, but if you want a direct sort of way of handling categorical variables, it's not available. Yeah, I like it that it's not binary in yeah. general. It should be fluid. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions? Now, 
Um, um, so I would read this to you if you've all sort of got your MacBooks and you know your Linux books, etc. So I'd like to you start you know, opening them and so you can start the installation of the library right now. So I do that uh, in terms of you by following these instructions. So you can do it exactly, you know, just copy all these instructions and open it uh, and try it out in a, in a so So, um, so I'm using the Ubuntu version because I don't know how, you know, what's the speed of the internet connection here. So uh, I'm using the Ubuntu version. This is the version of Ubuntu I just since this was actually given to me just last week. So then I realized that, that there's some, some issues with library it doesn't really install it easily, but I'll show you the tricks and hacks of how you can install it here. So um, you, um, okay. So the first step is you actually create a So the first thing is you need to have Conda on your machine. So I hope, so how many of you have already got Conda on your machine right now? Cool, okay. So for those of you who haven't got it, then you just Google Conda distribution on the web and download, download that version. So we'll first create a simple Conda environment. So we've already got one here. So I'll just label this as something else. actually cloning their repository, let me just walk you through uh, the, the repo itself. So in the repo, um, you will see the following, the following directories, the following folders here. Now one very important folder is the examples folder. Okay. So this folder has, uh, the network here seems to be slow. This folder actually has the links to uh, to all the tutorials which are there, the tutorial related to finance and a lot of other tutorials. Okay, so you can take a look at these tutorials here. And for each of the algorithms which exist in the library, there's a Python node to correspond to that. So if you want to learn how to use any particular algorithm, you can simply log on, you can simply migrate to the examples folder. Now another important folder is the AI360 folder and here we have the code for all the algorithms. Okay, so this is taking a while. Let's see what happens to the other stuff. So it's actually cloned which is good. So, um, so after cloning, we simply go to the library here. Yes, yeah, library. Uh, the network here is really slow. 
So I guess we can yeah, share them. Okay. So um, these are all the folders which are in the library. So all that you need to do is, you know, before you get installed on Ubuntu, I realized that you just need to comment out um, you know, two simple uh, steps in the setup.py file. So I'll do that just here. Basically, sometimes the setup actually does not read the uh, readme file well. Once you do this, 
then you are good to go um, in you know, running the various tutorial stacks. So if you do this much, then you can run the tutorial notebooks, which Dennis is going to show in the next, uh, the next session. So I think uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Dennis. And uh, he's going to take, take you through the finance tutorial in, in more and more detail. Thanks. Value either bad or 
good. That means that an applicant was more than 90 days late on a payment within a two-year period, and good means that they, they weren't more than 90 days late. So in, in this case, uh, we've actually, you know, this data set has observations uh, of actual uh, uh, you know, people who have taken out these loans uh, looking at their repayment history. Uh, repayment history. Uh, this table shows some of the features or in the data set. There are about 20 odd features. Uh, their names may be a little cryptic if you're not you know, in the consumer finance domain, but I'll try to explain some of them that, uh, that we need to explain here. Um, one thing that FICO has done helpfully is to indicate how we should expect these to be paid with respect to that target variable, whether they tend to be you know, whether increasing the value tends to be good or bad uh, in terms of someone's credit worthiness. Okay. Um, right. So, another caveat is if you would actually like to run this in real time, you need the data set from FICO. Um, we are not distributing the data set for legal reasons. So we're, we would refer you to the FICO to get the actual data set. Uh, to do that, you have to go to their website, uh, which you know, we have a link to it in our, our web page. I'm not going to do it live now because it does take some time. You have to submit a Google form. They have to get back to you with a link. So uh, you, know, you can try to do that now, but I'm not, I'm not going to do it in real time. Once you get the actual data file, uh, here are the instructions for where to actually put it uh, within the AIS 360 directory tree so that um, this uh, Python notebook and other things will find in the right place. Okay. <coughs> uh, maybe something to be aware of when, when you try this later. Okay. So let's go through the first persona, the data scientist one, in a little more detail. Uh, so this is going to show you a little more of what's happening uh, uh, the, the web demo that you saw. Um, so as Vijay mentioned, you know, uh, here we have chosen to highlight directly interpretable global models. Um, and he's already covered you know, in what cases you might want to use these. Uh, first as a data scientist to, to, to see what you're doing. And then to explain to other parties like business managers, lending experts, domain experts, regulators, uh, that your model is, is doing the correct things. So there are actually two directly interpretable models in this section of the notebook. Um, we've trained both the Boolean rule model as well as the GLRM that you saw. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to cover the Boolean rule. And, uh, I'll indicate where I skip over that section later. So we're just going to look at the GLRM. Model, and in particular, it's a logistic regression variant of it. We call it logistic rule regression. Okay, so, so now we get to some the, the first thing that we actually can run. So first, we're going to load and process the the, uh, the FICO data, this um, log data set. Um, and here. Um, a couple things to know. So we're actually, we've actually implemented some data set classes uh, for the data sets that are part of the toolkit. Uh, these just help with the loading and the data processing. Um, and in particular, we're enabling something, uh, custom pre-processing here called NAND pre-processing. This actually, so there's some special values in these data sets, some negative values. And we actually want to keep them as is uh, for these models. So let me run it and I'll, I'll show you what I mean. Okay. So it, it ran. So here is just a sample of the data. Uh, it goes five rows. And you can see here the different features. And this is what I was talking about. So there are some special values here that were converted to NANDs. And we're not going to you know, try to execute these, at least in this part of the uh, uh, in this part of the notebook. We're going to use these as is because the rule-based models. So we 
load up the data sets. The next thing we have to do with these rule-based models is that they actually require binarized input features. Okay. Um, the thing is, though, that both, almost all of these original features are continuous now. So there's a binarization step uh, that we have to do. And again, we provide a class to do that. It's called Feature Binarizer. Right, so we're going to run that on our data. And I'll I'll show you what it produces to, to explain what it's doing. Right, so here we go. Um, so now the data has been binarized, and what it does for these continuous value features is it applies a set of thresholds to them. So here are the thresholds. Uh, by default, there are nine of them, so we binarize uh, features into ten bins. And we do less than and greater than comparison. So the negation is equal to true setting means that we have the greater than comparisons as well as the last thing. And you can, you know, if, if you wanted to, you can kind of reverse engineer this or read what's, how it's being encoded. In this first row, for example, um, less than or equal to 63 is false, but less than 66 is true. Right? So the original value was somewhere between 63 and 66. So on for the, for the rest of these rows. So this is just a data encoding binarization step to allow these rule-based models to run. Uh, the same thing does happen, by the way. You know, that if you were running a standard decision tree, it's just kind of more behind the scenes. Okay. So now that the data has been binarized. Um, okay. So this next section is actually running through the Boolean rules part. Of that I was going to skip in the interest of time. So uh, I'm just going to ignore this section. Okay, now we get down to the part where we can run the GLRM model that uh, we saw in the web demo. Here we're going to run it for real. And because this is a binary, uh, because the target value, the target variable is binary value, logistic regression is the appropriate <coughs> version of this um, generalized linear. So that's, that's why we're calling it logistic rule regression here. It's logistic regression using rules. So let me run it. Right. So here we're doing the standard thing of importing the class name, right, instantiating it with some parameters, fitting. Um, Value feature to begin with, and here we're just you know, putting in that value directly 
into our linear model with this coefficient. Right? So that's that's one type of feature. The other type of feature are the rule-based ones. And those are indicated by conditions like you know, such and such is greater than zero. Or uh, for example, here we have average months in file less than or equal to 52. Right? So you can think of these as binary value features that were derived from the original one. So, for example, if somebody's average months in file were less, or indeed less than 52, this would be equal to 1, otherwise equal to 0. And that comes into the model with a certain coefficient as well. And so, this, this is a directly interpretable model. You know, if we had a much longer time here, we could stare at this table and, you know, reason about each of these rows, right? Um, but as, as we just showed you, there is a visualization that uh, greatly helps uh, in that process. So one of the things you might notice is that uh, these features are repeated. Um, so the, you know, here's that external risk estimate again. Here it's appearing you know, as a linear term, but it reappears again. For example, there are um, here it's appearing in the threshold form, right? And if I look harder, I can probably you know, find some other. So features appear multiple times in this table, and it would be nice to, to be able to plot um, something to summarize that dependence. Uh, so that's one thing to notice. The other thing to notice is that um, it so happens in this example, in this data set, that none of all of these rules involve only a single condition. So in other words, we don't have any interactions in this model. Um, you know, we don't have something like you know, percentage of trades and average delinquents and something else. Right? That, that's just how it turned out to be. Uh, but this is fortunate in terms of visualization as well, in that those interaction terms are the ones that are hard to visualize. Uh, but there aren't any here. So um, the visualization that we're going to present actually covers the whole model. Um, in particular, this, this kind of model um, is known as a, um, is something that is called a generalized additive model. So what that means is that, um, that again, the plots will make this a little clearer. It means that although you may have nonlinear functions of individual features, those functions are then composed additively. Right? So uh, there's no interaction between two or more features. So we're going to make use of the visualize method of the uh, logistic rule regression class uh, to produce those plots that you saw earlier. Uh, first, we're just going to check how many of these plots we're going to see. So uh, this table listed 36 features in the logistic regression model, but they only depend on uh, 14 of the original features. 15 minus 1 is 14, but this also counts the intercept. So there are 14 plots uh, that you can visualize. So here, for example, we're just going to look at the one uh, for external risk estimate. So this is this plot is the one that you saw before. Uh, it's a lot bigger now. Um, and it, it has summarized all of the dependence on this external risk. So there's an overall linear trend that's increasing, which makes sense because you know, this is um, a, a risk score, and in this case, higher means better. Higher means you're more likely to be a creditworthy. And you also see some discrete jumps, some nonlinear behavior around this uh, score of 70. <coughs> right? And that's where the, the algorithm is determined that you know, if you have scores Significantly above 70, that does, you know, that gives you an additional boost to your creditworthiness. Um, maybe we can look at one other one. So this one's kind of interesting. This is the. Um, so the next two have to do with credit inquiries. So you know, every time you apply for credit, an inquiry is made to your credit file. Uh, 
these features, that's what these features have to do with. And this one says, for example, that um, this is months since most recent inquiry, excluding the last seven days. And it, it takes a jump uh, right after zero, which basically means if your most recent inquiry wasn't within the last month, then you're okay. Right? Having it be having it being in the last month is a bad indicator according to this data set. So that, that's something else that you can see from, from these kinds of visualizations. Okay, so you can go through the rest of these, um, and with a little bit of domain knowledge, you'll see that they all tell sensible and in some cases interesting stories. So in the interest of time, I'm going to go to the next section. So this is the loan officer one, which again, you've seen before. Here we're uh, doing you know, case-based reasoning to explain uh, decisions made by the machine learning model. Um, yeah. By the way, but there's no time now, but during the break or after the session, for example, you know, these are all notebooks that you can run, so you can go back and play uh, with these you know, change the parameter settings, um, you know, change the, uh, the examples that you look at to, to get different behavior. So uh, this is all available for you to use. Right. So this first part is just some import statements. Um, I think I'm going to go quickly through these because this is just reloading the data set and, pre and pre processing it again. We use a slightly different kind of processing here because now instead of that um, directly interpretable rule based model, as Vijay said, in this section of the, uh, of the notebook, we're, we're training a neural network. And so that requires a different pre processing. Uh, here's a view of the data set again. Uh, you can look at the distributions of some of Features. Uh, here we're just splitting into training and test sets, doing some normalization, normalizing values between uh, minus a half and plus a half. Uh, so here is where we define the neural network classifier for the same task. Um, you can train the neural network if you want to. I think the code is yes, it's set by default to just load the pre-trained a pre-trained model, so that's what I'm going to do to, just to save a little time. Um, maybe of interest that the test accuracy of the uh, neural network in this case is not any better than the uh, directly interpretable rules model, the rule-based model. So uh, just, you know, one anecdotal example of the fact that Neural networks are not the end of the story. Right? There is a case to be made for directly interpretable models as well. Okay, so this part of the notebook takes you through finding similar examples to an applicant who is classified as good. You know, in other words, a, a loan approval or a recommended loan approval. So it is going to go through the training set. In particular, we're filtering out the um, training examples that were also labeled as good, uh, that were that were approved, and finding the examples within them that are most similar uh, to the applicants in question. So here, um, if, you know, in the web demo, we gave this person a name, <coughs> here just a number, right? There's index number eight. Uh, so here, we're just pulling out that record. So yes, this was an applicant labeled as good. Here are the feature values uh, for this person. And now we're going to use Protodash to find cases in the training set that are similar in terms of the maximum mean discrepancy, if you would like to know um, what exact uh, mathematical uh, uh, metric we're using here. So, we instantiate the 
explainer class, and then we call this explain method on this applicant that we just pulled out. And here we're asking for the five most representative uh, prototypes. Again, this is a parameter that you could easily change uh, if you wanted to see a different result. So it has done its thing. And now we're going to display. Okay, so here are the feature values for those five uh, most representative prototypes. And at the bottom, uh, we've calculated a weight. This indicates how similar these uh, prototypes are to the applicants in question. And you can see that by far it's this first one, this leftmost uh, individual that's most similar. Uh, the web demo has done some, you know, highlighting two of the features that are exactly equal. Uh, we don't have that in the, uh, in the notebook here. Um, this is a further look at the similarity of these uh, prototypes. Um, looking at feature by feature. So, where you see a value of one here, that means that the value is exactly the same as the applicant in question. So, you know, just looking at the number of ones in this uh, column zero gives you further confirmation that this, this individual is similar. Um, yeah, so if I were to, you know, give a little bit of a domain interpretation, I might say that this person was probably approved because, you know, looking at these other similar applicants, um, one thing to notice is that they have very little, they're carrying very little debt. So these two rows here, net fraction revolving burden, net fraction installed burden, again, these are, you know, percentages. Uh, this one, for example, is how much of your credit limit you're using. These utilizations are very low. So that, that's a likely reason why the model decided to approve this person. Okay. So I have to move on to the last section, which is the, uh, the customer um, personas. So here we were using contrastive explanations. Um, this first part is actually exactly the same because we're using the, the same data, the same neural network model just a different kind of explanation. So I'm going to uh, run through that. So this is all the same. It's just, this is just repeated so that if you wanted to, you could start from this section of the notebook and not have to run earlier sections. Okay. So here, this is the section where we actually do something new. Here we're finding those pertinent negatives for an applicant that was labeled as uh, reject, I believe. Yes. So again, the person had a name in the web demo here. They are index 1272. Um, oh, okay. So that it's already doing its thing. So again, it's, the syntax is similar, right? So we're invoking the class initializing it, um, setting some parameters. Again, if you want to experiment more with this, these are things that you can play around with and change. And then calling the explain instance method uh, of this class uh, to give us those uh, local explanations. So let's, let's see what we got. Right? So, okay, here I'm just displaying the results. So in this table, the leftmost column, uh, these are the feature values of, the, these are the original feature values of the applicants. The XPN ones are the ones, are those features, plus the minimal set of pertinent negatives that would take this person from a reject to an approved. Right? And the last column is simply the difference between the first two. Right? So we see that for this applicant, sufficient to change just three of their features and by these amounts. So you know, improve their external risk estimate score, 
from 65 to 76. Uh, it would help if they had about a year more on average in their credit file, uh, 12 months, and if they had three additional satisfactory credits. Right, so this is a kind of uh, contrasted or counterfactual insight that uh, the CEM method can, can give, and we're, we're showing it in action here. Uh, there's another example here of um, pertinent positives, yeah, which you can go through on your own. Yeah. Assuming that you have um, many counterfactuals that you can generate, what is the, the criteria to choose one in this case? Right, so I guess, you know, I can jump into it here, but uh, basically we are looking for a sparse set of things to change. And so this, we're trying to minimize the number of features that are changed as well as the amount by which they're changed. And mathematically that is done through uh, an elastic net norm. And there's actually a parameter here, beta you called it, right? Uh, this one controls, as you can see here in the comment, it says, control sparsity of the solution. Right? So you could adjust that to get, get more or less. Yes, question? Yeah, um, I mean, you're plotting basically the difference? You're plotting basically the differences there, but um, do you actually back check whether the model looks at these particular features, because in the end it's just difference in the data, but uh, like not reflecting no, 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 so it's creating those outputs, so there's a, if it generates a quadrant negative, there's a 100% guarantee that the model will classify Yeah, we classify it, but has, like, when you look at these examples, you have these three features, do you really can tell them that your neural network, which you want to explain, looks at these yes. three features? Yes. Yes. I mean, okay, so I'm because, missing that, because the neural network is the model, right? So we are giving you a guarantee that the new feature vector by that model will change to a different class. So you, for, for sure it is looking at those features, but that's why the class won't change. Right. Why the class change? So, you know so just to be clear, right, if you put in this XPN feature vector into the neural network, you will get a different outcome. In fact, this is how this XPN is obtained. So it's not through some proxy process. We are actually perturbing the actual model. Does that make sense? And all three have to be changed yes. together. And all three have to be changed together by these minimal amounts. Exactly. Okay. So it's a joint non convex optimization. And yeah, it's not a design. Yeah. I think you in the back. Thank you. I'm um, going back to the uh, first of three examples of the data scientist view, yes. um, where uh, you showed the example of a logistic regression based uh, model. Um, what if you uh, had a strong prior that interaction effects between some variables were especially important? Uh, would there be a way to use something other than logistic regression, like a classification tree, um, in order to um, get at? you know, to, to test that really strong prior on interactions. Right, so you bring up a good question because although this is called a logistic regression model, because it uses these rule-based features, it can form nonlinearities or interactions if it decides that they are there in the data. Right, it so happens that this data set does not lend itself to those, you know, the interactions appearing. But if they are strong enough, in some other data set maybe, and, and there are, there is another example of it here um, in a different notebook. They will appear, right? so that, that's one thing to, to clarify. Um, with regard to your question about a prior, I think that's something I would have to think about. There may be a way of, you know, um, adjusting the regularization here, right, to favor the appearance of certain interactions, because uh, by default, what logistic rule regression, well, what GLRM does is to favor uh, rules that are short, that have fewer conditions. Right? Um, but if you have domain knowledge that certain interactions are likely to appear, 
uh, there may be a way to modify the algorithm you know, to allow those to uh, appear more easily. I'm for the break, I believe. Um, so, up to you. Do you want to take one more question or have people talk to us over the break? Okay, well, one more minute. I was just going to ask a follow up to the question before. Would it be something that's common to do to say take your cat factor as well as synthetic one and then compare the synthetic? You know, what would you have to change and what would you have to save historically? So See whether your counterfactual will help closely represent what you have seen historically, or even potentially generate a counterfactual based on a, a, right. a so historic example rather than a synthetic one. Right, so here it's sort of unsupervised, which is my point. But you could add to the objective on the right, right, if you can direct it towards a certain prototype, which is my ad, which is a common prototype, which you know is a realistic. So, so you can do that. The other way is that you can also build like, uh, so if, if you have a model of the joint distribution or the behavior of how realistic inputs look, you can pass that to this method. So it will generate outputs and they will be novel outputs. They won't be something with like just selection, but which will sort of respect those constraints. If you 